as fitting into the perspective method that I have in my head. Now, um, I'm assuming everybody has been to an art museum before, right? Yes, everyone visited one. Yeah? Anybody who hasn't visited an art museum before? No. So, okay. So, everyone's kind of familiar with the protocols of the museum, but um, I also want to make this very interactive, so I'm going to be asking a lot of questions uh, and so hopefully you participate. Uh, First of all, I was thinking in this field and context, and I've been saying, yeah, so this is like first. But do we have, have we had other kinds of art museums or galleries that we could think of? Bronzes. Sorry? The bronzes of the museum. Right, so you could then think in a larger museum, there are certain artworks that are on display, right? Inside there have the bronzes. I don't know whether it's still there, but it was. Well, it's been kind of incorporated, so it is part of. So that's in a sense the National Museum, right? Uh, any other spaces you could think of? The art gallery, right? So for years that's that's what we've had and uh, that's made an anxiety. Anything else from like even earlier periods that we, we could now look and say that was an art gallery? From a past. Sorry? Tempers. Tempers, excellent. Yes. So, I mean, some of the earliest art galleries actually were, you know, Buddhist temples, Hindu courtyards, and churches, right? But we also have the other major tourist attraction we have, right? Which is also an art gallery, which is, which is seen here, right? So, that's in a sense, you know, it's a point of palace. Now, you could really think about, okay, but who really had access to these? You know, I, I think the religious sites. Yes, you know, uh, if, if you of the denomination in particular, you often had. So that was kind of people interacting with artwork on an everyday basis. Maybe in the palace, you had you know, much less chance. You know, there was talk that you will see here, a lot of that was covered. And there was, you know, all uh, covered. So maybe everybody couldn't really see that artwork. Maybe it was for uh, uh, the, the royalty only and maybe the people who worked inside there. So I mean, it's, it's you know, conjecture. But if you think historically also about art museums, that was what was very similar. I mean, we still know of the Vatican collection, right? Which, once again, that's, that's, that's a major religious institution owning a huge amount of art. And oftentimes, it's, it's a collection because there are a lot of pieces that are not even available right, for people. So that you, and so in the early periods, there would be times when these kinds of institutions, even sometimes palaces, they would have certain days when they would open it out for public or section of it, right? So like, for example, uh, the Palace at Versailles, I think it was uh, around the 14th century, they did open up certain sections for people, but you had to be a certain kind of person. You had to, so they said you had to have silver buckles and swords to be allowed in. And so there was a industry outside which rented these things out, right? So, so you have see how people left, the people rent it out and wear those and go in and access. So it was really only after the French Revolution that the Louvre was open to the public. Right? So now that's also, it's a palace, but because of the kind of like ideology uh, around having public access after the revolution, it was open. But now there are arguments also about then the architecture of, of these kinds of museums. Right? So people say the Louvre is, is huge, it's intimidating. Um, and so similarly, you have you know, a lot of national galleries that have these major steps. So like even to make it in there is an effort. So often it became a space for the elite. Uh, and, and there was also this notion that you, you had to have a certain kind of education to be able to access the art, right? So um, and we had a familiar French theorist called Pierre Bourdieu who, who wrote about how you have the production of taste in a sense. You have to learn how to be able to appreciate this. And so then people who, who kind of excelled in that and who, who kind of were the uh, people who really set the terms of what was good art and what was bad art, you know, so they, they became very powerful, right? So, so that, that's how, just even in terms of appreciation, how you know, power comes in, right? It becomes the relationship of power, of, of how, you know, who, who then has the knowledge to appreciate and then who doesn't. So I think art museums in particular, I mean, uh, you know, 
more than any other kind of museum, has had that kind of aura. And I think we have a certain period when you know, there were special buildings built for it. There was this notion of the white cube. Uh, in the sense, this is a white cube, right? It's all white walls, it's minimalist. So that the only thing that we do is to focus on the art. But I think it has also been changing, and, I, and that's why I, I think this, this you know, for start of a museum is, is, is so nice here, because um, even if you look at the, the title, right, it, it says um, 100,000 small tales. So there's an assumption that actually each of these artworks will tell you a tale. Now, in the earlier context, it was that you had to walk in and you had to have this kind of power knowledge, otherwise you, you were lost, right? And so you are you appreciated something because of a particular kind of brushwork or the design or the composition, but it was it was a particular kind of knowledge you had to have. But when we talk about something that can tell the tale, it seems like okay, it can be accessible to anybody, right? That, so so you could start with that kind of premise. But obviously, we also have other markers here. If you look, there's always a, a you know a sticker here pasted that is very nice. It's in all three languages, so that makes it very accessible. But so that provides a certain kind of framework for you, right? So you, you get a title, sometimes you go and, okay, when was it uh, con con conceived and produced? Um, sometimes you have, when was it acquired for a museum, right? Who, who has uh, lent it? Uh, and then what kind of medium it comes from, right? And then, of course, you have all been walking around with the curator's note, in a sense, right? So you also have that which offers you additional information. So in, in that kind of context, I uh, would like to walk to Paul and maybe try to offer some kind of interpretation that maybe I can bring to it, and maybe we can together work things out as well, right? So that's so the over, overarching thing I said was so thinking about absence, and obviously when you think about absence, there's also presence, right? So we kind of play with that kind of dualism along with then, you know, others that come in, like the visible and the invisible. Um, and, um, Obviously, temporality and spatiality, or time and space, is also very crucial for that. Right? So, I'm going to talk about some different kinds of contexts within which we can also then uh, read a, a piece of work and then maybe try to understand it better, uh, hopefully. Um, so, what I want to start with is um, look at uh, this, this piece right here, uh, which is called. So, um, at first part, I mean, I think you said, what, what is this map doing here? Right? Um, but obviously, it's a map then that there have been various kinds of interventions put into it. Now, how many people knew of Tenmore's work before coming here? So, that there are some of you who are you know, familiar with this work, right? So, uh, this is, is very interesting for a variety of reasons, partly because this is kind of the start of his own called parallelism, which has been doing you know, for about 25 years now, right? But this, this is kind of the very first time he introduces it. But I think what, what is also interesting for me, and here then temporality is very interesting, because in this context of, of today, right, we don't really have that many checkpoints, right? I mean, so there might be a younger generation that has. Not really experience that, right? So in, in that sense, this is really talking about a kind of landscape that existed but is no more, right? So in that sense, this is kind of making visible something that is is pretty much invisible now. We, we don't know if nearly appear, right? So those those are always these kind of queries that we have. And I, I think it, it's very interesting for somebody looking and thinking about also the way checkpoints operate, right? So in this map also there are a lot, there are a lot of absences here too. Uh, and then a very marked presence of checkpoints in particular places. So I mean, really study to, to start getting a sense of the relationship between what sites then have checkpoints, right? And so so that kind of interaction then. So and so you have and uh, it's interesting that it takes a tourist map. So you have the police stations, you have the hotels, you have the places of worship and uh, the, the way they work, work together. So, so here's he's thinking about then, in a sense it becomes almost a historical artifact now, whereas when it was constructed, it was very much a commentary of our times. Uh, 
know, and, and, and what was everyday reality for many people. Uh, and then today now it's more of an artifact where you look and you uh, recall you know, uh, what it might have been for people who never experienced it. Of course, there oftentimes there's a group of people who did go through this on a daily basis, right? So, so actually then the audience also becomes very important in terms of who is actually Relating and how much the information you have to really understand the space. So I just want to move to uh, this one. Now if you look at the title, right? It's a very, very long title. But can somebody tell me who has maybe read the character alone? What does it signify? Now somebody who is walking around without the book right, may really not know what is happening here, right? So it's a lot of numbers. Yes, so these are the, the GPS coordinates, but then of a very particular place, right? So now for somebody who hasn't really gone through the or experienced the war in Sri Lanka, you will read and say, okay, it's the coordinates of Mulu It still may not mean that much to you, right? But for you know, a lot of people who have been in this country, just the word Mulu then evokes a very specific context, which is the last stage of the war, right? So that already then offers us a framework then to then look at this. And what, what medium do you think this is? Hmm? Yeah, look what it says there. This, this is where this helps. C type photographs, right? So it's it's ancient, but I, I think I mean, you know, what what you said is, is very telling because in a sense it almost looks like watercolor, right? It looks like there is a certain kind of painterly quality to the photograph, right? And so do you think it's the and what what is it? Passport. Passport. One option. But a lot of it's a photo album actually. So uh, you see that that's um, that kind of uh, that glossy uh, material, right? Where it's but but then it's also once again it, it's almost the, the photographs here are almost invisible, right? So there's just very very little um, here. I think you might get a glimpse of of. So already then we are having a relationship between a very clear coordinate, right? Like like the GPS coordinate, which, which is there in a sense of all time, but that's always how Moody White Card is marked. But then you would think about a certain kind of similar quality about a photo album and then the photographs in it, right? And then maybe you start thinking, well, what made it like this? What what, what happened to this album? This is all that is left of it, right? So it starts making you think further about it. You might think it looks like it's the, most of it is the same album, but it might have been shown on different pages, or it could be, you know, um, a couple of albums that, that have been awarded. So I, I, I find this a very evocative piece just because, in a sense, of what is not really being shown, right? So already then the, the absent presence, in a sense, of, of people who are in this, who own this album, right? So it, it, it seems, in a sense, raises more questions um, than it really offers you an explanation. But it, it has a certain kind of haunting quality. Um, to it. And you see that this is also it was part of a larger work which was shown at, at the Saskia Fernando Ago, which was called afterlife, and I think thinking about the afterlife of photographs is, is also I think uh, helpful to reflect on this. So let's move to the other room. I just want to jump before 
There's visibility by a certain kind of invisibility, right? So you can really understand it then once again by reading the caption, which says Mass JDP supporter, right? Thank God. So once again, so you, you, you have to have more additional knowledge. So maybe somebody just visiting Sri Lanka, maybe you want to read JDP, right? So unless you really understand it was a militant group, and so if you're a supporter, you have to mask yourself. Uh, you don't get as much of the photograph as opposed to looking at it as an artwork, thinking of the, the, the framing, how it's positioned, uh, the color, you know, the certain kind of print, what kind of paper it was on, right? So, so there are many ways one could actually then appreciate the work in this space. But I also, I think the other part that I find very interesting is also to think about the, the invisible, in a sense, curatorial touch here of thinking about okay, what gets placed in in one space. And so I really feel this kind of is in conversation with uh, the work by Anoli Pereira there, where you have a certain kind of masking here as well, but it's, it's a masking in a sense of, of a certain kind of resistive uh, element of your resisting the gaze, right? So you have all these women, except for one, uh, refusing to be seen in a sense. So I, I find that, I mean, I think this, this whole room, I think, has very interesting in the place of a photograph, but I won't, I won't go into all the details. But the one last one I want to really stay with is, is this set of photographs. Um, uh, and these are from the 1930s, so I think that's really very interesting. Um, and here for me, uh, there's, there's an additional kind of uh, interest because uh, you have a photograph of Lionel Wendt, and normally Lionel Wendt was the person who was seen as kind of the father of photography in Sri Lanka. So here, it's interesting that he appears here, and the experimentation in these photographs are actually being done by Beeling, who was, was seen much more as, as a painter. Uh, and, and this is, I think, very early experimentation where he, um, you know, so here's Lionel Wendt, and then Mr. Beeling's um, aunt. And then he uh, merges the two uh, in, in this one. And so as the says, I mean, there's, there's a certain kind of ghostly presence here. But for me, actually, the, the person who still comes out of this much more is, is the woman here. Uh, but so it's, it's very early experimentation uh, of, of photography here. But also then what, what is present and what is absent, I think, is, is very interesting in this kind of splicing that you have in, in the photograph. And this one is also very interesting once again by reading where it's, it's kind of a self-portrait where you, you see you know, this is a very standard technique we have seen in so many other uh, you know, photographs, paintings where the artist stands in front of a mirror, right? But then he also plays with and somebody who's also behind as a person who's actually more visible than even in terms of trying to facial recognition, for example, is the person who is behind. And who actually that is. So I think it's also you know, playing the notion of that the, the, the photograph is kind of a capture of, of reality that when you see these kinds of uh, you know, photographs that, that play with reality in a sense. And I think the whole notion of the image and the ghostliness here is also very interesting because if you think of the, the etymology of the term image, it really uh, comes from the term imago, uh, which was what was used for, uh, the term was used uh, for funeral, funeral mass uh, that the, the Roman nobility used to make out of beeswax. And then there would be actors in the funeral procession who would wear this mask. So that kind of funerary connotation of image then uh, travels to here, I think, uh, when you're thinking of the images in the album, certain kind of funerary connotation to that. And then of course, there's of course these people who are no longer with us, right? So um, I, I find bringing a very kind of provocative quality to uh, this space here. So we're going to move to the next room now.
straight up, but can you tell me what else you think you might see in that? Um, uh, I don't think so. 
So it's more relevant. Yes, I but there is a kind of a the outer bank kind of sense but I don't know what they are because I don't know exactly exactly means awareness and it also it's three years now so I also No I, I I think it's I mean each shape I don't know why you come up with thinking of why this shape would useful for this particular group of, of landscapes. Um, so I think that gives a very kind of whimsical and positive discussion. Yeah, very whimsical and ironic person actually. Yeah, it's different. The, the way it's appearing. So maybe the two of experiment experimenting with different ways of placing you know the frames in, in different ways. Sorry? He sent an order of how many He did send an order. Okay, so that's very interesting. Because I mean that he did actually 40, so I actually only three of them. So that also would then disrupt uh, the you know how how he had organized it, but I'm sure in terms of what he has, uh, he must be having some sense of that. He must be chatting and find out more about that. Any other questions? Okay, so we just look a bit more closely at this, and I'm sorry, this is a small space, um, so many of you may not be able to uh, look at it closely, uh, but uh, this work is by uh, Jasmine Nilani uh, Joseph. And so this, we're coming to, once again, more recent time, because this was uh, created in uh, 2018. But she also has exhibited before, uh, she's been doing a lot of this work on fences, but, um, I was wondering whether the people who are close would be able to kind of mark out. Clearly, it's, you can see uh, the materiality is, is uh, quite varied here in terms of you know what has been used for the fences. Anybody who wants to take a guess at what some of these? So some of these are very uh, familiar and very easy to identify elements of a fence, right? Mm -hmm. Open up. Yeah. So this you are saying the coconut fronts, it's placed in a different way. This, yeah, you know, like on the side. Uh, I think this is actually what we would call takara, no? Ah, yes. Uh, uh, corrugated iron, right? So the different component, right? And I think the, the posts here are also interesting because yeah. these often you know, marked off uh, military installations and high security zones as opposed to the post here where you actually have a living fence segment <coughs> and then you have uh, more. And then you also have you know, segments of, of, you know, ruined buildings, it seems, that have also been incorporated uh, into this. And I was, um, I, I think, I find it very interesting to juxtapose this, for example, to the map we were looking at where you have then, you know, dimensional mapping and here uh, what what is interesting is it's just not the fencing but I find particularly interesting what the suggestion of things under under the ground as well right and uh, so when I was talking with her she was actually saying that sometimes people uh, bury things underneath to mark out fencing and I think this if you look closely is is you know somebody has put some um, maybe their jewelry or whatever, and, and buried it. But so the fence is what they're hoping would help them then return and be able to you know, spot that is. And, and so you, I think it, the, the fence itself, I think it's very evocative of, you know, fences can hide things, but it can also then keep people yeah. out, right? And so she was, was talking about the, the different times in her life that, you know, fences and that she spent uh, three years in a refugee camp. And so, you know, fences were very, very important in that context where people could you know, mark out their time spaces, but also the fences that kept people out. So the hours you spent uh, outside in the fence of a police station, for example, waiting to collect a pass. Right? So this, this was in Romania, this was before the end of the war. This was, uh, when she was a little girl. Uh, and then returning to Jaffna also, where people mark out their property with fences. and, and so when people return, also then 
what you know the found objects that they incorporate. So, like sometimes people would you know take a barrel and flatten it out, for example, and use other friends who see a lot of UNHCR tarpaulins, for example, right? Also, then become incorporated in people's fences. It's mainly us. Um, I, I think this is these don't really uh, correspond to each other, but it's just of thinking about and you know uh, different kinds of fences and and obviously then you know you have also this this uh, you know cliche that good fences make good neighbors and so she was also talking about how how you can have a lot of conflicts over fences, but fences also can be a space where you have interaction. So she she talked about you know her memories of you know people sharing things, especially the women. Sharing things or you know, across a fence, right? Um, food, or you, know, you suddenly run out of eggs and you just call out, and then your neighbor across you know, brings you the eggs, and so those kind of exchanges. So I, I think uh, once again, you 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 are offered one kind of representation, but then I think it does. There's a lot of other kinds of meanings you can bring to it, and obviously you know, people's own reading. So. Uh, depending on what kind of context they're coming from, or what kind of experiences you've had, uh, what kinds of things it might trigger in your own memories, I think it's, it's always important to think about. And just in thinking about representation and, and what's visible, we just love to this on Once again, a, a play on visibility and invisibility, right? Um, and it's um, a very, very interesting label which says this is not a white flag. So, oftentimes, of course, you feel um, a lot of people have said, you know, my, my kid could have drawn this wise kid and right? That's a standard thing. So, but it looks very simple. It's anybody could do a square and then, you know, change a little bit uh, and, and place it. But um, any, uh, anything else that works that you have heard? This kind of phrase before, you have to think of, of in, a, in a sense of a negative, right? So you offer something and then you say this is not, this is not the white flag, sorry. And also cover up, cover up. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. So I I think there's an additional uh, kind of value we are getting because of the kind of context we really think of, right? And so there there were these instances where people were coming out of the no fire zone, waving white flags, and then doing shots. You can see that very kind of ironic reading that the viewer is given of saying, you know, this is not a white flag. So in a sense, it's almost at the, at the literal level of that's what people read. But it also then uh, recalls a much um, older kind of representation. And I'm wondering if some of my students who studied Foucault with me will remember this. I don't think you know that's what. <laughs> but uh, uh, another artist, right, in, in another period who also played with words and representation. I don't know if you remember. This is the Exactly. I remember who it was. Yeah, so it was Danny Marguerite, right? So he, he was actually a philosopher who was also an artist. And so uh, he, he was really playing with the, the notion of, of you know, language and representation. And so the, the distinction between words and representation. So when he was, you know, when, when he drew a pipe, he said, but this is not an actual pipe, you can't smoke it, right? So it's, it's once again an ironic, whimsical kind of problematization though of also what things we have in, in museums, right? And then what value do we give to it? So I, I, I think there's a lot of that echo in Taylor's work, uh, clearly, but then he's also bringing his own reading. And, you know, as Miriam was pointing out, if, if you don't know that segment in our history of what happened to people using white flags, um, what happened to them, then you will only get a certain sense of, of the meaning. So, Context becomes also very important to bring to the message. 
Okay, so we just move to the last one. Very interesting conversations about uh, you know absence and, and presence in uh, in this, this kind of uh, what, once again I think very interesting weekly record uh, table and, and then uh, the, the photographs and and uh, everything beyond it. So um, I actually want to start with uh, these two uh, pieces of footwear and ask you all what. Um, what they evoke for you, or even what kind of uh, description you might give of the footwear, what kind of footwear is it? Yeah? Right, so now that's very interesting. Travis is now using the theme for this room, right? And then he's, he's also then doing an interpretation and I'm, I'm assuming you're also kind of looking at the prosthetic limbs and so what he said was he walks land mines. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I believe the artist actually was uh, uh, referring to 1983 and uh, uh, this is kind of his uh, memorial to people who were affected by the violence and so he started doing clothing and you know, various forms of uh, footwear and all that in tear, right? So these are all tear. Um, Sometimes when I were having a big debate on whether these both would fit only on the left foot or whether it's a left foot and, and a right foot, right? So it, uh, and I, I think it's pretty evocative that this is not a brand new silver, right? So you have the sense that somebody has walked in it, you know, for a long time and then kind of left in a hurry. And then if you read your curatorial note, I think the curator has also very interestingly linked it with the slippers you get in uh, this etching, which is called very provocative again, missing, right? So it's, it's a dog that in terms of the is mourning the absence uh, of maybe the owners of, of the slippers. And then of course, yes, you have uh, dry food food. So, start kind of seeing them in a particular kind of context and understanding also then what may have been the curator's thoughts on uh, putting them together. And then you of course have uh, this one which is called displacement and um, you know, uh, the I'm actually, uh, it's from Kirinachi and he, he was uh, an artist, he is an artist, so he started in this production. And very interestingly, the story is actually in the cabinet of medicine. So once again, I feel it's very other kind of conversations that are happening between the objects and pieces on, on display here. But I so saw he, he uh, had traveled a lot on his bicycle. Uh, and so he uses that uh, as his signature to evoke this sense of displacement, right? And then this certain mobility that he had with the bicycle and how how important the bicycle became to somebody who had to flee uh, the government's office. And um, this then once again um, for your who can't see it says study for family. And this is from that 1962 uh, time period. Um, anybody know the story of family and Kamala? Yeah, you know, why why don't you tell us?
was actually like even like prominence. It was accepted as the profession that a woman could do. So uh, the state uh, prostitute was not actually called a prostitute. She was called the dancer. Yeah, musician. So uh, the woman who was uh, very famous for that during that time was Margaret. And uh, so once Covenant happens to uh, actually visit the palace for this uh, dancing show where Madhavi is actually, uh, I think she was, that's the day that she is introduced. Before that it was Madhavi's mother. So then Madhavi is introduced as the court dancer and Covenant happens to fall in love with Madhavi. And Madhavi also, on that day, she is given the chance to uh, select a husband for herself. And she picks Covenant does not reveal to her that I am married. So he does not return home and he stays with Madhavi. For several days, uh, Khandagi awaits the return of her husband. She is advised by everybody to select another husband, but she does not do that. So I think she uh, personifies chastity and purity and like how sacrificial a woman should be. So uh, yes, and so the story goes on and after some time, uh, Kovalan starts to compare Madhavi with Khandaki because Madhavi actually does not stop her dancing and uh, being, being chaperoned by men. She does not stop that even after marriage. So Khandaki actually was not like that. She was very dedicated to Kovalan and Kovalan starts to see this different and he starts to fight with Madhavi. Then he returns back to Khandaki. But by the after time, spending all his money. Yeah, after spending all his money, after becoming a uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so he returns back to Khandaki. Then uh, it's actually a long story. <laughs> so uh, he returns back to Khandaki, and then they actually leave the village because nobody accepts Kovalan because everybody blames him. You are a man, you are a man like this. Why did you even come back? And then because then Khandaki also, why did you accept him back? So they leave the village. And, they go in search of a place to stay and then they uh, arrive at the village. I don't remember the name, but so they are. Uh, after some times, after realizing that they actually need to have money, Khandagi offers her uh, anchors, she has two anchors, and she offers one. She offers the gold anchors. Yes, the left anchor for her to go into the city and sell it to someone so that they can get money. So, uh, Khandagi's uh, anchors are in, like made with pearls. So, when you like shake the anchor, there is a very musical tone that comes out of that ringing because of the pearls. So, that's an important point. So, keep that in mind. And anyway, so, uh, so Kovar goes along to the city. And at the time, I think it's Mangala. The entire setting is in, in India, actually, so yeah, southern so, uh, India. So anyway, uh, Adurai, right? So yes, one way. So Kovalan uh, goes to the city with the anchor, and by the time at the city, something else happens. They are the queen loses one of her anchors. So the king's uh, wife, the queen, she loses one of her anchors, and nobody knows who the thief is. So Kovalan actually steps into this setting with an anchor. Which is very similar to the lost anchor. So he and he happens to visit the king's goldsmith with the anchor and asks him to name a price. So it is actually this goldsmith who has stolen the anchor of the king. But now he sees a chance to redeem himself. And what he does is he sends a message to the king saying, I caught the thief with the king's anchor. So please come and arrest me. And he asks Kovalan to meet him at an outside on the top of a mountain where he says that I will pay the price. So Kovalan goes there and the guards are also there. The goldsmith is also there. Everybody is there. So Khandagi, uh, meanwhile, feels that she can't stay home without her husband. And she also sets her on, on the way to Mathurai in search of Kovalan. So by the time Khandagi uh, steps into Madurai, she hears this story where a man called Kovalan who has stolen the uh, queen's anchor has been caught and he has been killed. So he gets killed because the king actually believes the gods 
and things that are colon is a thing and he hears it. So Kannaki is like furious when she hears this because she is very very dedicated to her husband so she runs into the sea shaking her anger which gives out that very ringing musical noise and then she goes there she actually confronts the queen and asks the queen to shake her anger because the queen's anger is filled with gems the sound that comes from that shaking is not as musical or beautiful as the anger of Kandaki. So the king now actually feels that he has committed a crime and Kandaki confronts the king too. But what happens is because he is the king and because he has to protect his queen, he asks the guards to uh, capture Kandaki and cut off her legs breast. Cut off her breast. So Kandaki being this chaste pure, pure woman, she does not let any man touch her and she says the breast that you threaten to cut off, I will take it out and I will like smash it on this rock and if I am a pure and chaste woman, uh, gods will send fire from heaven and burn your whole kingdom and that is what actually happens. I think that's the exact point that is uh, created in the artwork where she Rips off her left breast and hits it upon the rock, and then uh, God sent fire, and they set fire upon the whole kingdom. The king dies, the queen dies, everybody dies except Kanadi. All evil people. Yes, all evil people die except Kanadi. And from then onwards, she becomes nothing. It's a long tale, and there are also many variations on it. So this yeah. was very interesting for me who collects variations. It's a long version because some of them are really different. Yeah. Yeah. So Pakistani is worshipped yeah. by Buddhists as well. Yeah. 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 But I, I think the moment here is actually when she's mourning over the dead body, and then she yeah. also actually yeah. revives it. She sews him up when he is taken to heaven. She goes to heaven. But uh, so, I, what what I also found interesting though was that actually Tisaransi has done uh, many versions of, of this, and I managed to find uh, a couple of them. And I, I think the versions are very interesting. So uh, I think a curatorial note will say that this was a Dana Kubesekar's book, but it's not really. It's a slightly different version. You see that this arm goes backwards, whereas here uh, they are uh, they are going across like that, right? And his the colon is also placed, um, so it, it becomes all one one part of the, uh, the uh, it's, it's one complex in a sense. Whereas here we have another version of it uh, where she is kind of looking down on him, and this this was uh, when he was exhibiting it. Um, he had this piece. But what I find really interesting that in both these, her left breast is not visible in this one too. Whereas here, I think um, it's, it's not as pronounced. So it's a bit interesting to think about. But I, what, what I found then, um, the, the curator, and what something that I learned was that this actually was something he had been working with, uh, thinking about uh, for a memorial to the Emirates of 1958. Really, it was never built, but uh, I, I thought that offered a whole other reading then of that this article would, would think of looking to this. So, so I mean, this, this story is from the Silapaliha, uh, uh, very, very important you know, classical Sanskrit text that he was looking to that for memorial. And in today's context, when there's been so much debates about memorials and what kind of goes into memorial, I thought it was particularly interesting to uh, think. How he was, uh, you know, planning to uh, do the memorial, but unfortunately, uh, it was never he in fact did not have any memorials to any of the rights we have in these countries. Uh, but the last uh, part that I want to talk about is, is this piece of artwork, which is by uh, P. Krishnapriya, and it's called Artifacts from Jaffna, and and just continuing with. My interest in thinking about what's visible and invisible. This is the question I uh, invite you all to come and look at it closely. I mean, unfortunately, it's a museum, so you all can't move the pages and, and uh, look at it more carefully. But what she does, at, and this one again is inspired by a uh, uh, book of, uh, you know, the 
from uh, Jeffy Baba's collection. It was, uh, in, uh, this was another interesting thing that he went around for a couple of years ago where there was an exhibition in Daphna for three months of various art, art books. And uh, various people were asked to uh, offer a certain kind of response to that library of art books. And so Krishna Priya decided to kind of have a response to Jeffrey, the, the book on Jeffrey Baba, the, the collection of Jeffrey Baba's furniture. And what she does here really is uh, she has kind of pretty much embossed. So it's, it's very, very strange. If you look really carefully, uh, each of these pages has an embossing of a piece of furniture that has been taken from Jaffna and is being displayed elsewhere. Right? So, so it, it's, it's, it's a big, and, and on the other side, of course, she, she does this kind of tracing uh, using a carbon. So if you turn the, the other page, you, uh, on the other side, you actually have what she has traced. But when you actually look at the page, the, the first thing that comes on to is, is a blank page. So you have to look really closely uh, to understand then what, what is going on. And obviously, so it gets a critique of you know, people who collect in a sense as well, right? And how these collections are, are produced and, and what, what happens. It's, um, it's like a tracing, I think. It's, uh, it's, 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 if you hold it up, you know, you can see it very lightly. So this is the other side of it. Um, so just very briefly, I just want to point the um, uh, cabinet of resistance by uh, Shanathanan. Um, as I was saying, you know, this kind of story is there, and I welcome you all to come back and, and read it. And as, as I was uh, telling you, honey, I think you have to put a sign saying, please touch, right? Because so this goes the other way around. Where there, there are a lot of things in this museum that you can't touch or might be within a case. But this is one that actually invites you to open the doors and, and go through. Uh, so each one is a story of, of somebody who lived through uh, the war uh, and then the communists from the north uh, and, and the various ways that they resisted um, and, and survived uh, in, in war. So I won't say much more because I think that's something that you really need to experience yourself. And this is an interesting kind of connotation of like a library catalog in a sense, right? And so, you know, we have certain kind of diversity of knowledge uh, that is being problematized here when we're offering a counter knowledge about the So, very quickly, I'm sorry, thank you for your patience. I've really taken a lot of time. I just want to look at this complex view again because uh, this, this is yet another way people. Um, you have problems with art museums where they were like, so what's, what's, what's this, right? So it, the spark, it, it's a tire, you know, on the platform, but it's pretty you know, brand new. Uh, this is another one of the collections that around today. Um, but I, I think here is, so he's explained with this kind of, and this is, sorry, the big one is very sorry. Um, this link to the other artwork in the other room, right? Um, so, um, and, and this was also something that artists did a lot when they would bring an everyday object, right, and, and place it in the museum. And so, kind of problematize with the acquiring of certain kinds of objects, the kind of value that is then given to them. But what I actually found interesting was also then what, what the curator has juxtaposed in a way. Right? And this is something we talked about earlier. And, and in particular, um, I would point to. Uh, you know, the car and, and then um, the vehicle that's on fire. So um, this is also, I think, it depends on the kind of context you're coming from. Because as soon as I walked into the room and I saw the tire, that's what wrote for me. It reminded me of what it had been during the JNP uprising where we had what we call necklaces, right? So the particularly traitors um, they put the tire around the necks and it was set on fire. It also recalls you know, the South African context where the terminology of literacy originally comes from where a lot of people were going to be So, so for me, that's the connotation that comes immediately. But then, when fathers come in, it may be a very different kind of context, right? So, so in a sense, what, what I find interesting though is 
the, the conversation in the sense that he was having with this other piece of artwork. And I just want to end with these two by uh, Pandipala Vakta. Um, once again, going back to kind of thinking of what's about absence and presence and, and you know, temporality. Uh, this one is called um, uh, yeah, Raja Theatre Hall, right? And so uh, it's uh, a small shrine. You see these a lot in different parts of our country, but particularly in Dakar and Tamil Nadu, it's very lovely uh, shrines. And this uh, really was the latest work, the time that a uh, lot of the soon after war when were being redone, and so a lot of the shrines uh, were, were removed. And some of them have reappeared, and then others have gone to the So, this once again is then marking something that is no more, in a sense, right? So, it's, it's, it's a memorial to the shrine uh, that, that has disappeared. Uh, but, but I think thinking along those lines of visibility and invisibility, absence and presence, I find I like, with this because I think this piece of work really captures uh, that sense where this, this is actually uh, an, an ambulance on fire uh, in Fibonacci uh, in uh, 2009, uh, just before the uh, war ended. But uh, what uh, Palak was really trying to do was he, he works with uh, what he calls pyrography, which is where it's kind of the translation he is writing fire in a sense, where he works with the soldering iron and he, he was trying to trace out um, the, uh, the ambulance and realize that in his tracing he actually obliterated what he was trying to trace out, right? So um, I, I find this a very complex work in thinking of the attempts at preserving and representing and then being inadvertent, you know, what happens when really then destroying something in, the, in that process. See and think about the whole process. So I will then, sorry, take another hour. Thank you very much for your patience. And